single is not a crime. Would you agree with me? <laughs> Neither is it a death sentence. You know, as my wife and I were discussing presenting at a singles convention, I said, I have qualification for presenting at a singles convention because I was one single. <laughs> and I have experience in singleness. Adam was created single. And even if you get married, you will have, will have to live your life, a fulfilling life as a single person to be a successful married person. And if you're single today, it means that it is part of God's plan right now and part of his purpose for your life. The only warning I would give to uh, single persons is that if you're single and you do not plan to get married, you should not be dating. Are we together? If you're single and you don't plan to get married, you shouldn't be dating. But otherwise, you are special. What do you say? In the sight of God. Now, as I share with you a message, the message is entitled today, Living on Purpose. What's the message? Living on Purpose. Lessons from the life of Joseph. Because what I've found is that whether you're single or married, you are, it is easier for God to bless you when you have found your purpose and you're fulfilling that mission. What do you say? And that is where God wants to find you, living on purpose. You know, as I reflect on my own experience as a young man, I made attempts at different things in terms of career and partner. And the day came when I decided that, listen, God, I'm making some bad choices. What I'm going to do, I'm going to surrender my life to you and serve you. And you will bless me and leave everything else to you. And I can tell you and testify to you that it's while fulfilling God's purpose for my life that all the blessings came along. As the Bible says, I seek ye what? First, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. Let us pray. Father in heaven, as we open up your words, open our hearts to receive them, we pray, and glorify your name in Jesus' name. Amen. There are several experiences in the Bible and several examples of individuals who have lived a purposeful life that I could speak about today. But today I'm focusing on the story of Joseph. If you turn your Bibles with me to the book of Genesis chapter 37, and while you're turning there, I want to say to you that there are three transitions in Joseph's life that we're going to be focusing on and pulling lessons from it that we can learn about living on purpose. Joseph's transition, his first transition, was from his father's house to the pit. The second transition was from the pit to Potiphar's house. The third transition was from Potiphar's house to prison. And the fourth transition was from prison to Pharaoh's palace. And we have many lessons to learn from the experience of Joseph. The first lesson is that Joseph was willing to embrace God's dream for his life even though he, those dreams were bigger than his current circumstance. Are we together? Joseph wasn't afraid to embrace God's dream for him, though it seemed impossible based upon his current circumstance. The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 37, reading from verse 5, it says, And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it to his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. And he said unto them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamt. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose, and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood around about it, and made obedience, obeisance to my sheaf. And his brethren said to him, Shall thou indeed reign over us? 
or shall thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. There were two reasons why Joseph's brothers hated him. And for none of them we can blame Joseph. Because they hated him because his father loved him more than his brothers. And they also hated him because God favored him and blessed him with dreams. What do you say? But Joseph did not hide the fact that God had placed a vision on his heart. And he was not ashamed of those dreams. One of my philosophies in life is found in the book of this, but this half ages by Ellen G. White. He says, there is no limit to the usefulness of one who by putting self aside, make room for the working of the Holy Spirit in his life and lives a life wholly consecrated to God. And I want you, brother and sister, today, whether you're single or you're married, to say to yourself, or you're young or old, that there is no limit to your usefulness when you consecrate your life to God. What do you say? The dreams that Joseph got was that one day he would be a ruler over his brethren. Now, that seemed impossible because Joseph was the youngest brother outside of Benjamin, and he had 12 brothers. Now, can you imagine that God had to move from one, two, three, right through to 11 to get to Joseph? But Joseph was told by God in a dream that one day he would be a ruler. And I want to let you know, my brother and sister, is that as you look at your circumstance, don't doubt God's purpose for your life. What do you say? I could have doubted God's purpose for my life. I came from up the hills there, about 12 kilometers from here in Maroon Town, St. James. I grew up with my six, well, six of us in a single parent home. And my mother would send us, well, send me to Cornwall College miles away, sometimes with little or no money. I know the days of going to the pipe when everybody else is eating lunch, I would have to go to the pipe to get water to drink. Are we together? And water and hunger belly don't mix very well. What do you say? But God had placed a dream on my heart of that some, by the grace of God, I should do something for his glory. What do you say? Joseph wasn't afraid to embrace that dream. And you should not be ashamed of what God has put on your heart. The second thing is that Joseph would learn that true greatness is not accomplished by merely dreaming about it. Dreams alone will not get you there. What do you say? The call to live on purpose will take you through difficulties and challenges. You see, Joseph was hated by his brothers. And the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 37, verse 20, when Joseph's brother decided to put him in a pit and kill him, listen to what they said about him. Verse 20, it says, Come now, therefore, let us slay him and cast him into some pit, and we will say some evil beasts had devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. So for the most part, what they really hated was Joseph's dreams. What do you say? Let us see what will become of his dreams. My brother and sisters, I want you to know that you're living in a sinful world. What do you say? Having good dreams, having great dreams doesn't mean that you'll have a smooth path. The fact that God chose you and lay his hands upon you, it doesn't mean that everyone will favor and be excited about your dreams. And that's why sometimes you have to be careful of who you share your dreams with. Sometimes when you think the people who should be excited about you, <laughs> the people you think who should be excited that God is doing something special in your life, mark my word, brother and sister, those are the same people who are cherishing anger and bitterness in their heart towards you. And sometimes the only way you will know is when you're in a situation where they have power over you. 
you'll see the true intentions coming out towards you. And Joseph had to learn that the hard way. And then White in the book, Ministry of Healing says, many who sincerely consecrate their lives to God's service are surprised and disappointed to find themselves as never before confronted by obstacles and beset by trials and perplexities. They pray for Christ's of character, for a fitness for the Lord's work, and they are placed in circumstances that seem to call forth all the evil of their nature. Faults are revealed of which they did not suspect existence. And like Israel, they question, if God is leading us, why do all these things come upon us? And Ellen White responded and said, it is because... God is leading them that these things come upon them. Because guess what? Trials and obstacles are the Lord's chosen methods of discipline and his appointed conditions for success. Are we together? Sometimes a favorable environment is not the best environment for you to grow in. I have seen that firsthand, where sometimes when you have a boss who loves you and favors you, it's not necessarily a good thing. Because all it does is to incite grudge. And you yourself don't learn much about life. And so God allowed Joseph to be sold into Egypt and to be separated from his loved, from his loved one in order to learn some valuable lessons. But that brings us to lesson number three. And that is, Joseph valued his relationship with God above his dreams. Let me repeat that. Joseph learned to value his relationship with God above his dreams. What do I mean by that? When Joseph was sold into slavery, I can imagine, my brother and sisters, that that would have meant the end of any bright future he was thinking about. That would have meant the end of any prospect of becoming a great ruler. That would have meant the end of any prospect of ruling over his brothers. But Joseph, in, in the book Patriots and Prophets, my brothers and sisters, then anyway comments that Joseph, as he traversed and head towards Egypt, Joseph remembered the God of Jacob. Joseph remembered the God who appeared to Jacob at Bethel and promised him prosperity when he had nothing. And Joseph bowed his head in prayer and prayed to that God and committed himself to God. That despite the circumstance he will face, he's going to serve God. What do you say? You see, oftentimes as young people, when we face the prospect of a great life, we become so caught up with greatness that we forget God. Are we together, Regine? <laughs> when people begin to flatter us and say you're bright and you have promise and you have future, we begin to get caught up with the greatness and we forget about God. We spend more of our time strategizing to see how we can get into high places. And we spend little or no time studying the Bible and in prayer. Let me tell you something. I'm talking to the parents now. Your children, the, the least thing that your children need right now is too much attention. And too much flattery and praise. If you notice, brothers and sisters... Jesus came here as the Messiah. And the record of his life from 0 to 30 is very small. <laughs> to the point people are wondering, what was he doing during, during those years? Well, my brothers and sisters, those years were the quiet years. Are we together? Those years were the years where he was learning and developing and growing and understanding. And our children need those years. If you're going to be great and God is going to use you, you need that quiet time with God. And our young people must learn this and understand that true greatness 
comes from developing certain characteristics while no one is watching you or while no one is praising you. And Joseph understood this principle. And so he went to Egypt and through his commitment to God, he decided that he was going to be the most faithful servant that Potiphar ever had. Are we together, brethren? Joseph had no prospect of greatness, but he decided, I'm going to be faithful to God to the point where the Bible tells us that Potiphar recognized that something was special about Joseph. Potiphar recognized, if you turn the Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 39, the Bible tells us that God was with Joseph and Potiphar saw that everything that Joseph put his hand to, it was prosperous. And then anyway, it tells us that this prosperity didn't come merely from any special blessings from God. It came because Joseph applied himself and was faithful in little things. He did his work diligently. And I'm telling you, young people, if you're going to be successful in life, you need time to develop those soft skills. You need time to develop those principles. According to Proverbs 22 and verse 29, See as though a man diligent in his business, he shall stand before kings, he shall not stand before mean men. You know, when I first graduated from college with a degree in business, I felt now that the world was waiting for me. And I'm going to do some great things for the Lord. But then after job hunting, the only job I found was to work in a printry. And while working in a printry, I found myself working by myself most of the time. All I'm doing is collating papers one at a time. <laughs> and binding books. And working behind the scenes. And I said to myself, Lord, is this a great life you promised? <laughs> Is this the greatness that we agree that, that is going to accomplish in my life? But then I committed myself. I said, Lord, I'm going to do this work anyhow. And I tell you, I worked there for five years. And those were the most precious years of my life because working in an environment like that has been a blessing to me up until this day. Are we together? In the book, Ministry of Healing, page 472, Ellen White says, Many, how many? Many are dissatisfied with their life work. It may be that their surroundings are uncongenial. Their time is occupied with commonplace work when they think themselves capable of higher responsibilities. Often their efforts seem to them to be unappreciated or fruitless. Their future is uncertain. And here's what she says. Let us remember that while the work we may have to do may not be our choice, it is to be accepted as God's choice for us. So the point is that wherever you find yourself right now, whatever assignment God has given you, whether it is on a platform or in private, do your work diligently with all your heart. Because God is helping you to develop skills and habits that will be the foundation for success later on. What do you say? Amen. Too many of us are so in love with this stage that we can't spend time to learn some important lessons in life. And it was this commitment that helped Joseph to learn and to grow and to, and to gain prominence eventually in the eyes of Potiphar. But while Joseph gained prominence in Potiphar's house, another trouble was brewing on the horizon. What do you say? And that brings us to lesson number four. Joseph learned to resist and overcome temptation. We know the story that Potiphar's wife laid her eyes on this handsome gentleman and decided in her mind that she, since she is in a position of power, hello, 
and Joseph has no future outside of what we decide. And since Joseph is a handsome and attractive young man, then Joseph has no choice but to do what I say. And so after trying to lure him by saying, come and um, stay with me, be with me, and Joseph would resist, we know the story of how she tried to force him and Joseph resists. My brothers and sisters, my young people, you are going to face people like that in your life. You are going to come upon people of power who think you have no future but in their hands. There are going to be people who think that your only prospect of a bright future is in their hands and therefore you must do what they say. But what she didn't know is that Joseph had already committed his hands in the hands of God. What do you say? Joseph was not for sale because he was sold out to God. And so he was deaf to her allurement. He was deaf to her power. Her power did not attract Joseph because Joseph had already committed himself in the hands of God. Whether it is a boss at work, whether it is male or female or a powerful family member, there are some people who think that you have no future except to doing what they say. But my brothers and sisters, Joseph had already learned that true success in life cannot come about when you live a double life. Joseph understood the principles found in Proverbs chapter 6 and I would encourage every young man to read verse by verse Proverbs 5 through to 7. Are we together? Because it tells you that by the means of an adulterous woman, a man is made into a piece of bread. It doesn't matter how great you are. It doesn't matter how promising you are, how talented you are. If you give yourself to a life of sin, God is going to bring you down. Just as what he said to Eli in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 30, when Eli would not correct his sons, he said to, he said to him, Them that honor me, I will honor. And they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. So my brothers and sisters, my young people, you may not have much money in your pocket. You may not have that degree that you want so badly. But you are precious in the sight of God. Don't sell yourself cheap. Don't give up to somebody who claims to have power because there is no power outside the power of God. So understand that the only person who you need to be loyal to is God. And so Joseph said to her, how can I do this great wickedness? And sin against not Potiphar, but sin against the God who I devoted my life to. And so, brothers and sisters, we know the story that because of his stance, Joseph was lied on. <laughs> you know, I, 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 when I teach uh, young people the class, God of Human Life, I always say this to them, listen, of all the things that people can do, do to you, telling lie on you is the worst. Are we together? <laughs> of all the things people can do to you, <laughs> Telling lie on you is the worst because telling lie destroy your reputation. And even if you're going to recover that reputation, it's going to take some time. So Joseph was lied on and he found himself in prison. But that brings us to lesson number five. That while in prison, my brothers and sisters, Joseph learned to trust God in adversity. Joseph learned... That no matter how faithful you are to God, no matter how diligent and faithful and honest you are, life is unfair. Are we together? Until you learn that lesson, you're going to be vulnerable to defeat and depression. Until you understand 
that if and when you're faithful at work, you come on time, you do your work faithfully, you work over time and give everything to the boss, somebody can tell a lie on you and you put yourself in trouble. And Joseph had to face that situation that when Potiphar decided, and you know Potiphar is a wise man, because if Joseph was guilty, it would have been death for him. But Potiphar knew that Joseph would not be guilty, and so he put him in prison. And so here was Joseph in a strange country. No loving father to beg for him. Are we together? No one to plead his case. No one to show him favor. Joseph reflected on his own experience and said, I did everything faithfully to these people, and yet this is the reward I get. Joseph then turned to God and prayed to God for God to get him out of prison. And days turned to weeks, and weeks turned to months, and Joseph was still in prison. And then Joseph decided that this is part of his experience. And after praying to God and recognizing that God did not do anything, he committed himself to God and said, listen, if this is where God wants me to be right now, I am going to be the most faithful prisoner that they have ever seen in Egypt. And then anyway, it tells us that Joseph wiped his tears and began to work on lifting the burdens of others. He began to work as a missionary there in a prison in Egypt. And that's why when the baker and the butler came in the prison, my brother and sisters, Joseph was very kind towards them and willing to help them. Joseph was determined, my brother and sisters, that if this is what God wants me to face, I am going to face it by the grace of God and let God do what he wants. And it was right there in prison that God would bring to him the opportunity to use his talent to glorify him. What do you say? Because lesson number five comes to us. That eventually, if you read chapters 41, 40 and 41, you know the story that Pharaoh had a dream. Two dreams, as a matter of fact. But they meant the same thing. And when they searched for persons to interpret that dream, the only person they could find to interpret those dreams successfully was Joseph. God had been preparing Joseph for this moment of his life. What do you say? God was the one who gave Joseph those dreams. Let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. Joseph was not the one who came up with those dreams. God who has seen the future was the one who placed those dreams on his heart. And I promise you, brethren and brothers and sisters, is that once you're faithful to God, God is going to be faithful on his part. It might take long. <laughs> you know, it's one thing when you pull your bootstrap up yourself and, and do stuff and get success. But it's another thing when God blesses you. Because when God blesses you, it's going to be beyond what you ever could think or imagine. Because I'm sure that no matter how ruler Joseph thought himself was, he never imagined that this would have happened to him. Joseph learned that God is faithful to his promises. What do you say? Joseph learned that if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all things will be added unto you. Joseph learned, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of his counsel, but he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of waters that bring forth his fruit in due season. Joseph learned that there is no limit to the usefulness of one who by putting self aside make room for the working of the Holy Spirit in his life and lives a life holy, consecrated to God. Joseph learned, fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious of the workers of iniquity because they shall soon be cut down like a grass 
and wither as a green herb. Joseph learned, my brother and sisters, that there is blessing in being faithful to God. There are people who will come to you and say, listen, I've been keeping myself for years and I've been doing this. And yet, and, and you, you, you're waiting on God. Find, you have to find some way of, of, of being happy on your own. My brother and sister, that, those are the words of the serpent. I can stand here on this pulpit and testify that God is faithful to his promise. That the dream he gave Joseph when he was 17 years old, he was now fulfilling it. That Pharaoh, because of Joseph's wisdom, made Joseph the second ruler in the kingdom. Joseph was single, but Pharaoh gave him a wife, and Joseph had no two children. What do you say? When Joseph was sold into slavery, when Joseph was put into prison, all of the prospects of a good life and favorable blessing, they all came tumbling down. But there was one constant that remained in Joseph's life. And that is, the Lord was with Joseph. Today, my brother and sisters, whether you're single or you're married, please let that be your testimony that the Lord is with you. What do you say? With you in the pit, with you in the palace, with you in Potiphar's house, with you in the prison. Do not forsake the Lord because when he blesses you, he is able to do abundantly above all that you can think or imagine. You know, when I was growing up and going to high school, I wasn't the one who was the talker or the attractive one or the one. I wasn't very tall, by the way. I was very short. And so I was very invisible while going to high school. I wasn't very popular. But it was until I got to teenage years that I went to six feet two. <laughs> but by then, when I got handsome enough to draw some attention, I was wise enough to know better. That is not every attention you, you, you need. Are we together? So wait on God. Don't measure yourself by the other's accomplishment. Wait on God. Because they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. I always say that, listen, I prefer God's choice for me. Because God has better taste than me. What do you say? When I was there trying, as a young man, trying to find a, a, a nice girlfriend, I was always making mistakes. And I said, Lord, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to leave this into your hands. You provide somebody, you know my likes and my dislikes, who is for, my, for me just the same. And God in his providence, what do you say? While I was doing ministry, he brought along a young lady who was also interested in ministry. Because you see, what you don't want, you don't want a career or a spouse who will go out of line with God's purpose for your life. And if you're in God's purpose, when God blesses you, he's going to bless with someone who is in that purpose as well. What do you say? And I can tell you that I can testify today, after 17 years of marriage, that God is a good God. And even what you never thought about or think you need, he'll provide for you. That brings me to the final lesson. In Joseph's experience, Joseph would learn to forgive his brothers. Are we together? Joseph would understand that the problems he went through, the things that he suffered, were not merely because his brothers hated him, it is because there is a devil. <laughs> And he would also come to recognize that the success that he had and the blessings he received 
are not because of his goodness and faithfulness. It is because of God's goodness. And that's why if you notice in, in, in Genesis 45, Genesis chapter 45, reading from verse 5 to 7, Joseph could say to his brothers when they came before him and, and he revealed himself to them, they were very timid and wondered if Joseph was going to take revenge on them. But Joseph had been converted. What do you say? Joseph had already settled in his heart with his brother. It says in verse, verse 5, Now therefore, be not grieved, nor angry with yourselves that you sold me here. For God did send me before you to preserve life. What do you say? For these two years had the famine been in the land, and yet there are five more years in which there will be neither be earring nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you a prosperity, a posterity, sorry, in the earth, and to save your lives by a great deliverance. You see, it is one thing to be faithful to God when things are going bad. It's another thing to remain faithful to him when things are going good. <laughs> because there are some of us who have been through adversity and we trusted God. But as soon as we get a little dollar in our hands, as soon as God blesses us with something, we, we, our story now becomes me and me alone. And you, your story now becomes where you pull yourself by your bootstrap and you were successful and all the glory go to you. But thank God for Joseph. What do you say? Joseph recognized that when Potiphar's wife told lie on him, if it had not been for the Lord who was on his side, he would have been a dead man. And so when Joseph got power, all of that was in his heart. And he began to realize that it was God who placed him there to preserve life. It's not himself. And that's why he was able to treat his brothers with kindness. Because he recognized that his blessings and position was not for himself. It was because of God. What do you say? The other thing too, brothers and sisters, is that Joseph's story could be told the way it was told because Joseph submitted himself to God. Here's, what, here's the flip side to this. There are some people in life, my brothers and sisters, who had they been the one who went through what Joseph had been through, the only testimony they would have had was what was the evil that people did to them. Are we together, Bridget? Have you met anyone like that before? The only story they have to tell is that the reason they are not successful, it is because so-and-so hold them back. So-and-so never give them the opportunity. So-and-so fight against them, and that's why they are here. But my brothers and sisters, people like Joseph, who live on purpose, whether they are in the pit or in the palace, God is blessing them. Whether they are in prison or in Potiphar's house, they are living on purpose. And the story they have to tell is not about what people have done against them. The story they have to tell is about how good God has been to, it, to them. And that's why the story that Joseph had to tell his brother was not about the sleepless nights he had when he came to Egypt. It was not about the thing that Potiphar's wife did to him. It was that God sent him here. Through trials and difficulties, God has sent him there to preserve life. The question is, that is Joseph's story. What about yours? What is your story? Where are you right now in the manuscript that God is writing for you? Are you in a pit? Are you in Potiphar's house? Are you in prison or in the palace? Wherever you are, 
may God help you that your testimony will be that God was with you. What do you say? And that was Joseph's testimony. God was with him in his father's house. He was with him when he was sold into slavery. He was with him in Potiphar's house. He was with him in prison. And the God of the mountain is God of the valley. What do you say? May God help us to live on purpose that God can accomplish his purpose through us.